Women Matters, finally again in October. It's almost the end of October already, 2023. And we are left in three today, and we will have, in German, we say, ein flotter Dreier, no? <laughs> <laughs> What does it mean? Uh, a and nice... this is when you explain it. In... <laughs> you a nice conversation in three, let's say, you know. Do you want to, German, my con German uh, partner, would you like to start with a check in? <laughs> I'm Gertraud from Germany in the middle of Frankfurt, north of Frankfurt. Um... And I had an exhausting week, <laughs> so I re I feel like recovering. Um, last week it was a lot. There were uh, several members of my family sick, including my husband, who was really ten days in bed. Mm. And I was I didn't really uh, get it until the end of the week how exhausted I was, no shared meals, no conversations, uh, no hug, nothing. I mean, he was just <laughs> flat. And, and then the other one had a uh, big infection and a high fever and third one got some, I, I mean, it was like, and something happening during the week. Um, uh, business wise so it was like oh, it was they uh, there was a um, a call cancelled on Friday afternoon and I was like I, I held myself said I have to do this because I mean clients and so on. and then they they cancelled and then I was really like like a flat tire <laughs> within minutes and I spent most of the time in bed and going for long walks. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's a, I, I didn't realize that. It was really like being concerned about the people you love. It, it, yeah, and, and then the, the two wars, at least two wars, uh, they also like capture, um, some energy and yeah I I thought we're I I didn't realize how much that has impact so I'm fine I slept a lot and and so but when you're in it you you don't realize it it's yeah that's at the that's end how the, that's how the, the nervous end. system works right the nervous system kind of saves us from at least initially from acknowledging how much stress we're under, but it catches up. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the latest news <laughs> on my side. Is everybody well now? Is it better? Uh better. It's not not done yet. I mean the fever is down and but she's still she's still not well. And I, I told her go to the doctor and get another week. I mean she is really in recovery so yep okay we we'll take but the over. little ones are well <laughs> so good, good, good. um i am christine from carlsbad california and i was not here at the last meeting i was visiting relatives on the east coast which was a very nice trip um spend time with my brother and spend time with my sister and Tom still has a brother and a sister back there so we saw them and uh old friends and other relatives um I felt really honored because my niece drove up from New Jersey and that's it's about a four hour at least a four hour <laughs> trip maybe longer so she came up just really for a little over 24 hours to to see me and brought her whole family. And that was delightful to to be able to see them. And uh, yeah, it, it was a good trip. Um, you know how it is visiting people, though. It's it, it, it can be exhausting, um, especially with a big time change of uh, it's a three hour time difference. Mm -hmm. So came back, resumed work 
and um, yeah, things are going pretty well. Otherwise, um, already feeling like we're heading quickly towards the end of the year, which is always a little bit of a hectic period. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, health is okay. Tom's doing well. I've been doing well. Um, nothing that's unusual good. there. That, that's yeah. what I wanted to ask you, how he is doing. Yeah, he's, mm -hmm. he's doing well. So we've, uh, and the trip back east, like Hungary, it, he did okay on the plane, even though you're sitting for hours and hours at a time, he did fine and could get up and uh, walk around. So uh, all of that went well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I could fix his hearing because he only says, hears half the things I say, but you know, that's, that's probably good. <laughs> <laughs> then I can mutter under my breath and he won't hear me. <laughs> and I will turn it over to Heidi. <laughs> yeah, I had, I'm quite tired too, or t uh, done in, in the sense of what you're saying. I saw it today. I, we were at the neighbors picking olives. I had picked all my olives the whole week and we were there four hours uh, all in, uh, you know, without a big pause. And I felt like, oh, no, I have to go home. After, after lunch, we, I went home and did some cleaning of the olives. And last week I had a group here. I didn't have to do much, but you know, I I had to hold the space for for the people. So it was also it was nice, lovely people. It was a yoga retreat of a friend of mine uh, from Germany, and it was. But having people around and being some way responsible, uh, it's like you say, you you feel it afterwards. They left uh, the other, yesterday, I think, very early in the morning. And, um, you know, you hear them go uh, get up at four o'clock in the morning to leave at 4.30 and sleep is not so, so perfect. And as you said, these uh, wars, it's not really, you know, it's no fun to hear about what is happening, say in this little bit sarcastic way. And um, yeah, the news which I'm trying to understand what is going on. That was last weekend, the weekend before I did a crash course in history to understand how come that these things are happening. And um, yeah, observing what is happening in both wars, it's not very good. So that is uh, eating my nerves too. And as you said before, I heard that too, no? We we know that when you are working and doing and be in stress and the first day you are you have time, then you get ill or something like this. And this could be a good topic. Stress or how recovery from stress. How can you avoid stress? Uh, do you have any or avoid? Maybe not. You cannot avoid it probably unless you are sitting in a hole somewhere. <laughs> have no contact with the outside world and other people but uh, how can you manage it and uh, lower it in some way is it the topic for today sure signora psycho psychologica <laughs> <laughs> you want me to take the lead <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, I well, didn't say that I'm in Italy because uh, you were so nice to present yourself where you are. And I'm Heidi in Italy and the olives don't grow in Germany. They grow <laughs> in Italy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you, Christine? Well, I, obviously, as you just said, Heidi, stress is not avoidable. Um, but... I think it depends how much how how stress affects us depends whether we can feel we have an effect or some some way of managing it. So I think it's more about managing it as opposed to preventing it, obviously. Um, and each of us comes into a situation with it depends what the stress is. Again, if it's something that you're familiar with, like maybe 
uh, Gertrude, you, your family's ill, but you've been in that scenario before, taking care of sick people as you raised your family and, and have done all that. So it's not unfamiliar to you. But yeah, um, you probably felt effective. You probably felt like you knew what to do as best as you could. Um, so that's helpful when stress, when during stress, we feel we have a way to manage it or we have we can be effective in some way. I think the stress that is uncontrollable, like a war, <laughs> you know, that we have nothing we can do about that. We're just kind of passive um viewers of what's going on. And I think in some ways that's more detrimental to us because we don't have uh, we don't have a way. You can manage maybe have by not watching the news. You can manage it by, you know, deciding how much you want to expose yourself to it. But we don't have any direct impact on improving uh, a war situation or, or other things like that. Um, so health, though, I mean, I deal... Uh, a lot of what I deal with with people is I have a woman now who's a client whose husband has a brain tumor and mm -hmm. it's I've been on this journey with her as he gets sicker and sicker and sicker and she's doing really well in terms of what she can manage but it's like you know it's like a snowball that's getting bigger and bigger and there's less and less as he gets sicker, there's less she can manage about it or do anything about it. I mean, she's trying, but basically what it comes down to now is he's sicker and he's kind of losing his mental capacity. Um, it's really just kind of being there and, and making him comfortable and trying to remove stress from his life so he can do the best he can. But it's stressful to to go on this journey with her. Um, I have another new client and she, her husband died two years ago, over two years ago. And she's been in therapy this whole time, not with me, but with somebody else. And she's just still struggling to have any bounce back, any resilience uh, from losing him. So it, it, it depends. Stress can stress, stress, like, losing somebody that you love, that can be a stress that's just kind of ongoing. Um, and hopefully some things, you know, are going to resolve like an illness. Uh, you know, if somebody has a fever, you know, it's probably going to get better. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell, but, but being with people who are under stress, um, is also stressful. Hmm. I believe, yeah. I was thinking when we were talking about this topic now about when Mark died, no, the three months to his death, that yeah. was also stressful. But I didn't, as you say, Gertrude, I didn't really. Yes, I know. I knew I was in stress, but you are sort of an automatic thing. You know, you have to take care for this. You have to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And this. It goes on and on and you don't have enough time to think that you are stressed. And as soon as the situation changed, no, then I felt that I was in stress. And to say about your clients, I think it took me all these five years to to really be open for other things again and not thinking about uh, him anymore, what you, we could have done or not could have done, whatever. No, It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Also, you, I at least was quite normal you know like outside quite normal but inside I felt the the loss of yeah I'm an aircraft for you know that it is always it sees the, the 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 missing things so I was kept a lot in in missing a man in my life or a person with whom to be confident all the time every day you know and uh it's yeah and now i'm sort of yeah it's it's better now I'm, I'm you know tranquil but not the stress at the beginning it went also into depression for a while not mm -hmm. heavy depression but the mm -hmm. feeling of depression you know mm -hmm. so i can i can relate to this with your clients that's mm -hmm. mm, not nice and, you know, what What I'm finding interesting is some people lose a spouse or a loved one, a parent or, or child or whatever, suddenly, like unexpectedly, mm -hmm. you know, 
an illness, an accident, this woman who I'm referring to, her husband just didn't wake up, you know? And, and so she was totally un, not expecting that. And there's a, a level of grief that goes with not having been able to say goodbye or say the things or be at all prepared for that. Yeah. But as you know, Heidi, going through the medical process, other people get traumatized because when they have a loved one who's been ill, the whole medical thing um, can be also very stressful and traumatizing. And by the end, you know, you've gone through so much with that person. Uh, that's also very hard to overcome. Yeah, 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 and we are, <laughs> we don't get to choose. So no, we're, we're just uh, served with whatever. So um, my brother died forty seven years ago in an accident, and he was ten days in coma. And um, so the first days we just hang in the ballot and. Uh, the last three days was uh, it was clear that he's gonna die, mm -hmm. so he, there was no no possibility to bring him back. And I was on a scouts camp, um, preparing meals, and I was eating out of the can. I was like, I I put on three kilos within those ten days. So, because it was, it was my favorite brother and it was, um, mm. yeah, I mean, I had to go there. I had said that I would go and I couldn't do anything. I mean, you could just wait and uh, let the doctors do that. And uh, just recently, so, so in summer, he had, July is his birthday, the accident and the death. So it was all, all July is, is always kind of not so easy. And at the beginning, it was like, whenever I talked about him, that was, I was 20 at that time. And, and um, yeah, but still now when I'm, especially at in summer but also sometimes when I talk about him there are tears coming up and and so I think um it it gets softer and uh manageable and everything but I mean the loss is still there so it's it's not you you don't get over it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so, How old was he, Gertrude? 16. He was 16. Oh my gosh. He just he had his driver license for the for the motor. Mm -hmm. Um just just had it. And my parents gave him a, a little, yeah, so motorcycle for the for his birthday. And this lady who run him over she had her license just one week and so there were two beginners coming together mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um what helped me was to know that he was very happy at that time he just had a new or girlfriend <laughs> so it was very like um and he passed his driver license, he's passed his um, hunting license. And the hunter, he was pretty close to who was over 80. And he, but he took him everywhere in the so he was a guardian for for a certain forest. And he they, they, there is this um, old the, the old deers. Um, the the antler with big antlers so you 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 you're allowed to do that once in 20 years to shoot these mm -hmm. and he gave it to him as a birthday present knowing that he would never be able to do that again mm -hmm. 
So, um, so he was really happy. And, and I thought, I mean, to go when it's best, I don't know if you know that saying, but mm -hmm. something that, that was comforting me. Yeah, I just wanted to to say it's never away. It's never over. It's just the way you you go with it. It's mm -hmm. it's different. Yeah. I was thinking about the stress which the woman you said he was overtaken by a car. The stress that the woman must have, you know, yeah. that is the worst case scenario of every car driver. To, to kill somebody by, you no, know, uh, yeah, and that you begin your driver's career with that. It's it's on top, yeah. Whatever I think, every uh, in all moments, even if you have driven for for thirty years, when you when it happens to that, you can never be happy again when you when you have caused the death of a person. Yeah. I, whatever, even if you are not guilty in the sense that you didn't do it on purpose, but still mm -hmm. you caused the death of somebody. Mm -hmm. I imagine that a major stress, actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. she, we tried to keep, reach her, but they didn't want to get mm -hmm. in contact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What you said. I don't know why I went to that length but mm -hmm. when you talked about mark i i think it's it's not over I, I i mean you were so close to him and i still get emotional when i think of him yeah i'm getting over in the sense that it is not all the time anymore that i think about it and that i for instance this summer i didn't go a lot to this to the grave Mm -hmm. And I didn't uh, water the plants. Now I I, I reduce the plants and uh, put mm -hmm. something else in. And you know, it's it's getting. I'm getting more used to be alone again. You know, and uh, not having the partner I I would like to have. You know, it's not so imminent. And, yeah. And, and and yeah. I'm open. I would like to find a new partner. No? Even if I'm old, but you know. <laughs> I still feel quite active. All this olive picking, which I did these days, you know, I'm. I mean, it's it's tiring, but I'm I'm running around. Running is exaggerated, you know. Not anymore like fifteen. But <laughs> uh, I feel quite energetic. So maybe life is. I, still I think what what the the difference is that it's not stressful anymore no exactly it, so not dealing that's that's for me the the, yeah. the difference that it i'm has... not in that stress that i was at that time but um there is more like um we is mol in english mol <laughs> i just wanted to finish this mine <laughs> This is still hanging here nearby, no? The photo. Yeah, of course. And the the last photos when he was still uh, already very signed by death, I kept them about a year around. But then I decided, no, they have to go away because it was too, you know, too, mm -hmm. too much sign of death, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, uh, um, Gertraud, that I have interrupted you. No, 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 it's fine. I, I, I just said it's it's like in music, it's the minor. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um minor, yeah. More. yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the... Mm -hmm. It's softer. Yeah. Soft okay. sadness. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But not acute or not. Heidi, did you find anything about your you know, your integral knowledge, integral sensibilities, integral perspective helpful with Mark's passing? This is a question. I find the integral perspective since I learned it always helpful from that time on, no? When I started to understand what it means, integral, I found that the huge... Um, change in my life a huge help in my life and 
if it's specific for that, I don't know. Maybe more the the spiritual practices of the last years and so on that may be more important uh, than than the integral thinking, let's say, and the integral patterns. More the trying to trust in something which you could call God or something like this, you know, and maybe in um, the Buddhist teachings uh, are a little helpful to know about death and. Uh, you know, also knowing that uh, people are still, when the dying process takes longer than just falling over and be dead. So that's why I kept him at home for three days. And these things, you know, they were helpful. I don't know if it's directly integral mm -hmm. uh, influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, about Wilbur's book, Grace and Grit. Oh, yeah. Which is actually sure. my favorite book of his. <laughs> and it's not that integral. It, it it has some aspects, but I think he was just, at that point, he was just beginning to create his um, his work. But even he doesn't necessarily have a very big perspective in that book about dealing with his the passing of his wife and you know, not real sure how he ended up coping with that. Yeah, uh, we when in the dying months, let's say, of Mark, we were thinking about the book and I ordered it in English because I had it, I think, in Italian or something. And so, but I, I don't think he read it, but we talked about it. And before, when his daughter died some years before, we had a wonderful um, retreat by D.H. Almas on on uh, CDs and we 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 watched them I think twice and I think that gave him a lot of uh, support the considerations I gave it away to somebody and now I don't know where I can get it back I've forgotten who who, who took it what was it called Heidi DH Almas it was a retreat on uh, on on dying and they on their website long time ago I mean it's now Eight nine years ago, uh, I I bought it there. Uh, this I think I still worked. haven't understood what you said. H D H D dot H dot Almas. That's a spiritual teacher. Ah, okay. Almas with two A and in the middle. Mm. It's really it was really good, and his teaching is good. Yeah. That was a big help. Mm. Yeah. And, and this and was really stressful for him, for Mark, when, when the dying process of his daughter and uh, the other daughter, he, he was she was so distant and only on the funeral they met again. And, you know, he never really complained about these things, but I, I saw it, the stress which he was undergoing with the impossibility to to be near the daughters let's say and to sort of repair their childhood where he was not he felt not to be an adequate father he couldn't defend the the daughters against the borderline mother mm. so that was yeah Oh, Hanali is coming. Hanali. This, when I see the seaside, there is no stress <laughs> when you are there. Hey. <laughs> Good to see you. You're still uh, muted. She has short hair. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm Hi. Late, but I, Summer I is my... coming, huh? It's, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> everyone. Good, good. Nice to see you. We have talked about stress in life and death and 
uh, the stress which death is creating to also to the people who are still alive, you know, and this is the topic, not necessarily about death, it came over to death and Gertra talked about her brother's death many, many years ago and how she is still touched every now and then by re-feeling this and uh, I talked about Mark and now you come in. Do you want to share something? Yes, thank you. Um, two of my uncles passed within 24 hours last week. And wow. so they were both, um, they were husbands of my mom's sisters. So two of the sisters, husbands. And the one is already passed, but the one sister has already passed a long time ago. So her husband was much younger than her. And then the, the other one was really one of my favorite uncles. He was really naughty, always teased us to bits. And uh, his wife is still, she's the only living sibling of my mom. And so when I got the news, I, it was a very strange experience because during when my mom passed, I was completely calm because I was with her the whole time she, she trans transitioned, not in person but psychologically and psychically. And I experienced it very differently from other deaths that I have had in my family specifically. It was really because it was like I was guiding her across the threshold, so, so to speak. So there was lots of calmness in it and, and peace, but also joy for her. And, but now my uncles, it was very different. It was, I don't know, I obviously didn't have the same relationship with them as with my mom. So the, the connection between me, me and them is not the same as with my mom, which might perhaps describe my grief that I felt when I heard the news of that loss of somebody leaving from this plane. And now as I'm sharing that with you, I come aware of how our sense of connection impacts our experience of death because me, myself, I'm not afraid of death at all. Yet I'm still human, so I still have emotions and feelings and feeling the physical loss. And after my mom's death, I can still feel her today. I can still communicate with her. But it's not that easy to communicate with my uncles because I didn't have that relationship with them. So I feel the loss differently, more physical, more emotional of them departing from this plane. But I could also feel and sense my cousin and my aunt's experience from far away. Was they about 400 kilometers from here? And my other cousin, um, who I knew had a troubled childhood and the second husband of his mom really sort of saved them. So I knew he felt like him as his real dad. So I felt, in, I, I could feel his emotions, but I was not connected to it. I don't know if that makes sense. So I could have compassion for it, but in a different way. Mm. And the interesting thing is what happened is when I, I let my siblings know about the, these two deaths and I just shared the message in our WhatsApp group saying, I miss my mom today. I really miss my mom that day. And my sister for the first time expressed, she's so sorry because she has her own grief, her own experience of my mom's death was very different from mine. And her grief was also different in that sense. But it was the first time she reflected back of you missing your mom. So that was beautiful. I don't know how that's related to your topic of stress, just this without death. <laughs> but I do understand in my own experience, I was reminded with this Israel and, and Palestine thing going on, I was reminded that I was in Istanbul when there was a bomb going down on uh, happening on the plane in Istanbul where I was living actually. 
And how at peace I was because again, I didn't feel any fear because I didn't have any relation or connection really with what was happening there. I was like an outsider. So I could have compassion for them and empathy, but there was no connection to them. So mm. that was interesting. But I could feel their stress and I could feel their fear and the worries and the concern and the anxiety. But it was like I was outside of it. It was like mm. I was protected from it in some sense. I don't know if that helps. I'm complete. <laughs> I think you cannot um, let everything in from everybody, from m billions of people. That I, I think there is a, a valid protection somewhere. Yeah. In the connection between death and or stress was that um yeah we we talked about the stress we had last week for example in and then other uh yeah other events or parts of history when when we went through stress and when we are in it i mean like caring for, for your mom or mark or so then you just do what you need to do but afterwards it's possible that you collapse and and so our system is is uh holding us up and i said on friday for example i had this like a client canceled the meeting and within minutes i was like <laughs> like a flat tire and and i think that's that's our system working with it uh to yeah to do what you need to do for example when when there is a sable tooth tiger you have to run from you don't think oh i'm so stressed so <laughs> you just do it and and yeah but afterwards you you get how much that affected you yeah I'm wondering if these uh, events, for instance, when you hear that it had happened, for instance, a baby under a child under the car and the woman, the mother succeeded to, to uh, put up the car and get the baby. If this is out of stress, when the in unusual forces are coming to you in these situations, you know, so the. I, I'm not sure if it is out of stress or if it's something else. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. it's completely adrenaline soaked. Uh, <laughs> there, there was also a runner. I think even a hurdle runner. I don't know, but he broke his. He fell down, broke his thigh. I mean the bone, <laughs> and ran and got the silver medal, and then he couldn't walk anymore. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, like, so adrenaline hel helps us really to to overcome that um, and and do things you you wouldn't believe that you could do. I mean, you couldn't do it voluntarily, but I think I I would be able to <laughs> to lift a car uh, if 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 it would my it would be my child. I mean, it, it's just incredible what that takes out of of you and i think for short episodes it's it's marvelous that we can do that but where stress is really hurting is if it's ongoing and and you live on mm. this as if life depended on as if you are always in in death threats I think no. then it it flips and and hurts you. Connelly, we were talking about the difference for people whether they know that a death is imminent versus a shock where you weren't expecting it. And I assume both of your uncles were old enough that it wasn't totally shocking <laughs> for them to pass away. But at the same time, had you any idea, or was it a very sudden thing? I was completely not aware of it. Yeah. Or they were, you know, I they were both apparently ill, but I wasn't aware of it. So the one mm. had cancer, which I was not aware of, and the other one had a 
big stroke two weeks ago, which I was also not aware of. So it was a shock, but I mean, they did have their, they had, they had full lives. Yeah. You know, they were not young kids, for example. But I do agree with you, uh, Christine, that like my dad's death when I was 17 was complete mm. shock, complete mm. shock. And I was in such trauma for so long. It really took me almost three decades to heal from his death. Because it, as a young uh, teenager, it was, and I only died in my arms, so it was more, even worse. So I couldn't process it. My body didn't want to process it. It was like, not only my mind, my body didn't want, my, my cellular memory didn't want to holding him. Was uh, It took me years to really work through that, just the cell memory. And mm -hmm. I kept on having these dreams. And there I... This, and there I was paralyzed. It was, I was literally mentally and emotionally paralyzed for almost two years after his death. Mm. Where I cannot tell you what happened in my life. It was like a blank. So the, the shock put me in a paralyzed state. So if you talk freeze, flight, and flight responses of the nervous system, my nervous system shut down. Freeze, yeah. Yeah, it was just complete freeze because the shock was so intense of how it happened. So, yes, Christine, I completely agree. It's different from when you expect like somebody's ill uh, or old, and you know that they're, they're in their time. You kind of you kind of prepare yourself. Even with my mom, she had um, a, she had a very she her back was disintegrating, and she was in hospital two years before she passed. And even then already, we kind of started preparing ourselves. Her body, her body was giving up. So you slowly start preparing yourself for her to go. I mean, she was 93 when she passed. So it's not like you're expecting her to live till 200. But it is different. It's a different scenario from when it's quick, especially mm. if it's that shock that you speak about, Christine, most definitely. Yeah. And I think it's another stress when you expect it but have to live through it. Like when you say with the brain tumor and it's he is declining and 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 you have to facilitate that in a way. Then I think it's also very big stress, but it's it's a different one than when you freeze and when you like. But also the person who is dying is going through stress. Whenever you hear a diagnosis, no, for what you, something is not well, and then you hear some horrible words, and you ah oh, immediately you think, oh, what will happen, and and so on, no. Was it's... was Mark? Do you remember if Mark was at peace? I mean, what was, was he fighting? Was he, I, I mean, I saw him not that long before he passed away, but I, what was your experience of how accepting he was of it? And if that had an effect on you? I think he for a long time thought he might make it then when you were there. And that was the day of the first chemotherapy and he, he felt better with the oxygen and everything. And he, for another week or two, he thought it would maybe get better. And then at a certain point, he realized that it was not better, that it would go down. And we talked about it a little bit. And I reassured him that uh, he can go. I won't hold him back. And I, I would somehow cope with it when he is not there anymore. At the end, I think he was quite in peace, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he didn't expect that it came so quick. It came in from one moment to the other. No, he had a sort of stable way of going ahead with if he need to go to pee every hour and even less and go always with the oxygen and so on. But he still moved around with the ran behind with the oxygen bottle and so on. And then it could have gone longer, you know. But uh, then he had this attack of breathlessness and fell over and was dead. Maybe this, the last few minutes were stressful because he 
what we hear from the Buddhists that the liquids of the body uh, uh, go uh, out. No, and he had this feeling that he had to pee and what didn't want to pee in the on the sofa and everything, and that made him stress. But I think when he understood that it was about that he wouldn't come out of it, I think he sort of came to a maybe not completely stress free, but. Uh, a sort of acceptance that that was the way to go, you know, there's no other mm -hmm. way. So, wow, it, it sounds like you were instrumental in uh, reducing his stress by letting him know you're going to be okay, even if that's not what you were feeling, you know, but your your words were that I'll make it and giving him that gift of not being stressed about you. You know, you're saying don't that's don't be stressed over me. That and was that, my intention, you know, maybe yeah. that when I said uh, the in, uh, spiritual teaching were more important than integral, I, I knew that this is often a concern of uh, of dying people. What do the others? Uh, so and the, so I reassured him that it's OK. It's not OK, but it's OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that you will be OK. Mm hmm. Now, do you remind me of my other uncle? My aunt passed in a terrible car accident, and they were very close. But he had he had um, some tummy some stomach cancer, so he was very ill. And my cousin was getting married, so she asked me to work with him a little bit because he didn't want to go to the wedding, although he wanted to be there because he was also again he was worried that he would need to go to the bathroom and things like that. So he was stressful. So she asked me in the morning before the wedding if I would work a little bit on him. And I went, remember I was sitting with him and, and he had all these terrible cancerous stuff on his body, like knots, uh, mm. like balls. Lumps, yeah. yeah. lumps, and on his face. So he was also very, he was extremely stressful because of the way he looked, because he, he didn't look well, because on his head as well even though I was wearing a hat. And I remember I was just trying to calm him down. So I was just rubbing his body gently. And I was just speaking to him about his wife who passed and whether he wants to go to her. And that he, and whether he knows that his daughters are grown-ups and they, they will be fine if he passes. They're kind of giving him permission to go, that they are okay. They don't want him to suffer. And then I pushed him into the into the church and we were sitting at the back. And during the whole service, I was just telling him how beautiful he is. Like he's so he's a really beautiful man. That regardless of these these things, he is he's a beautiful being. And rubbing his body, his his legs, while we were sitting there. And I could feel he was calming down a little bit. Calm down. And then my cousin asked me, because she saw he calmed down so much, if I would work on him again the next morning before I leave, because I slept oh, I was in another city. And then I asked my daughter to work with me on him. So she was sitting on the one side, and I on this side. And I gently spoke to him about, again, whether he wants to go to his wife, um, whether he wants to stay, it's his choice. And again, also with his daughters and his grandchildren, they are fine. And I think we worked on him for about two hours and just rubbing him. And, and during that time, some of these lumps disappeared from his body. It was incredible. It's like a miracle. And again, just reminding him of how beautiful he is and talking to him about his childhood, which I knew was very, was very traumatic. And that it's okay to let go of it. You know, he doesn't need to hang on to his past. And it was completely calm. The eyes were like baby eyes. It was soft. Where before it was big and fearful. And we then left. Um, and that night he passed in his sleep. And my cousin, when she let us know he passed, she said to me, she can't believe how, how calmly he passed. His whole body was at peace. And before it was all stressed because of the disease. And... Yeah, for me, that was just such a sacred experience. I'm grateful I can share with you ladies, but mm -hmm. 
it was again that reminder when we give somebody permission to go that everything on this side will be okay, that it can reduce the stress, and also just to remind the soul how beautiful it is. And that this passing is not doesn't need to be traumatic. Mm. That's coming. But I have the choice, first of all. And that reduces obviously then the stress and the fear, especially fear of not knowing what's to come, especially if people have a very strong religious background where they 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 believe in heaven, but they also feel afraid to die. Mm. It's a paradox. And um just to calmly be present to that transition. You don't have to do much. Now with my uncle, we we, we were intuitively rubbing him because he knew how he felt about his body. And just being touched lovingly was sending a message to him that he's actually okay. doesn't matter what he looks like. The soul is beautiful. So mm -hmm. thank you for listening to that. Mm. Wonderful. That was lovely. Yeah, I think when you are able to witness a death in this way, that is a spiritual experience that is sacred in many ways. Yeah. yeah. I was with both parents and what you just shared, Hanali, was, um, yeah, it felt similar to my father's passing. He was like so shivering and, and he was so in in fear and i mean we have an abuse past and i was sitting there and 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 i said it was not okay and i can i don't know exactly my words but something like um and he was so I think religious background, he was so afraid of hell. I mean, and I could tell him, it's okay. The angels are waiting for you and they will, will greet you. And, um, and we will take care of mom. I mean, she was, uh, um, had dementia already. So he was really scared what happens to her. And he said, you don't have to. We we will take care of her, and she will be fine. And um, and yeah, there is no hell you have to fear. And yeah, and it's it's okay. So I I can me forgiving him helped him to to calm down. And and he, I mean, for a day or so, he was like. He knew he's going to die and he couldn't he couldn't let go. And and then so the last day before he was like gone, not yet gone, but uh not reactive anymore. He was just staring at me. staring is not the right word, but he was like gazing at me and and then I saw like a tear coming down. And and he was, and then he waited for my brother to come home, and I wanted to take my children, but on the way he said he just passed. So, but it was, yeah, I I I I couldn't bear the fear, I mean to see how fearful he was, and. And I had worked through that with therapy and everything, so I could just let go of that rest of, yeah. And um, yeah, and when we siblings um, put the the coffin down in the in the in the grave, and I I could really like look and say nothing else to say. I mean, it's everything is has been said and. And it's good and it's complete. I would <sighs> I couldn't help but think with your story and Hanley's story that you you know you're both talking about the sacredness, you know, in, in this process and passing over into that other side. 
And it just made me think again about this war that allegedly is over religious differences, I guess, sort of, um, and how it, it couldn't be the least sacred thing. You know, it's like the least sacred thing when they're fighting over religious ideas um, and hatreds. And gosh, it, mm -hmm. it's just such a contrast to what the two of you talked about um, and how important that sacredness is. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I fine. think it's even, it's thousands of years old with this um, Palestine and Israel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it's it's like as if there was this, uh, I don't know how to, so. No, yeah, to say something two about. Two siblings that. hating each other. Something like this, yeah. And, and passing it on to their next generations. Yeah, yeah. It's so hope, old. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't even think that it's about religion, actually. No. It's about something else. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's so clothed, unholy. It's clothed in religion. They clothe it in religion, but it's not. Hey guys, I gotta yeah. go. I gotta be at work in uh, in about yeah. half an hour. I wanted <laughs> just to say the last word, you know, we started with stress and we ended up with death and mortality. And I think we are very near of the All Saints uh, of the death uh, holidays. So it's maybe not by chance that we arrived there. It's next week, more or less, you know? So thank you, ladies. And wonderful. Yeah, I wanted to say that I put the link uh, to when we started with stress. <laughs> so okay. I, I like that talk. Yeah. Well, yeah. So on uh, on November first, All Saints Day, we can, in our own private ways, you know, revisit some of these people and uh, that we've lost and and loved. So wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a nice call today. Thank you. Lots of love. Bye bye.